Praise the Lord, everyone. Sean, I'm back with another video for you all. Uh, today, I wanted to talk about the conversation that Christ had with the rich young man. Now, I have talked about this in the past, but I wanted to give this conversation its own video and just highlight how this conversation shows that we are saved through faith and not of works. So this conversation comes out of Matthew 19 verses 16 through 26. So we're going to start at 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So in 16, you have this, this young man who comes to Christ and addresses him as good master. Now, in the Greek, this, this word master is uh, the word didiskolis. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, didiskolis. And essentially, that is an instructor or a teacher. So you will see in some different versions of the Bible, you will see teacher. You will even see rabbi. Here in the, in the KJV, they say master. Now, is there anything wrong with referring to Christ as, you know, a good teacher? No, I mean, he is good and he is a teacher. But the thing is, this man was addressing Christ, not with the understanding of his divinity. So Christ in 17, he says, you know, why do you call me good? There is none good but one. That is God. So some people would like to use that verse who deny the divinity of Christ and say, well, see, this man called him good. Christ said, why do you call me good? There's nothing good but God. But we have to understand that he only addresses him with the understanding that, you know, he is a someone who's knowledgeable of the scriptures, you know, much like the Pharisees. You know, he's someone who's very knowledgeable, but yet, you know, he doesn't address him with the understanding that he's actually God. And this is why, you know, Christ had Christ addressed that fact. So Christ continued, he said, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So this, this young man, you know, is asking Christ, what must I do? What good works am I supposed to do? And Christ ad addresses it, right? So, the fact that he's calling Christ good, but at, but at the same time not acknowledging his divinity, he's making it basically seem like there is a man on this earth who is not God that is actually considered righteous, basically under his own efforts. So Christ addresses that fact first, that there is none good, right? That includes this young man. But then Christ says, but if thou will enter into life. So in order for someone to enter into life, they have to be good. And Christ made it known there is none good. So this man has already been answered by Christ that, hey, you're not good. You're asking, what can you do? You're not good enough. But Christ gets into it. He says, keep the commandments. So the man asks, he saith unto him, which? So Christ answers him. Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Now, Christ tells them, you know, if you want to be good, keep the commandments. And we have to understand keeping the commandments is not just about just about obeying the commandments. It's about always without fail, never transgressing God's laws. So Christ goes down some of these lists of the law. And this young man says, I've done all that. I've done all that from my youth. So already in his head, he figures that he's actually good, not taking into consideration what Christ had just said previously. There is none good, only but one, that is God. 
but that didn't register with this young man. He's still figuring in his head he's doing enough according to what he thinks is good enough, which mirrors a lot of mindsets today. There are a lot of people who feel like they do good enough. They are following enough to either be saved or stay saved. But yet, every time we see that scenario, Christ always exposed the person or people that, hey, you're not good enough the way you think you are. So, this, so Christ says, you know, you shall not do any murder. Do no murder. Now, Christ let it be known that you can have hate in your heart towards your brother and still be guilty of murder. Christ said, thou shall not commit adultery. Christ let it be known that if you even look at someone with lust in your, in your heart, you've already committed the adultery. Now, I'm going to assume that this man probably felt like I've never physically killed anyone. I've never physically committed adultery to anyone. So therefore, I've been keeping the commandments. But has he ever had hatred towards another person before? Has he ever looked at anyone with lust in his heart before? Because if that's the case, he is guilty of these things. And has he always honored his father and mother, right? Has he ever said anything dishonest about another person? Has he ever took anything that wasn't his without permission? All of these things, people can feel like, well, I've never done this and I've never done that. But when you really think about it, you will say, you know what? I have. But according to him, he says, I've never done it. So... Even if he's never done these things, the question, the fact of the matter is, have you done these things perfectly, right? So he asks, what lack I yet? Christ answers him in 21. Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect. Now, before we go on, he says, if you'll be perfect. So if this man is good and Christ already let it be known, there is none good but one that being God. If he said, what else do I lack? If this man was really good the way he thought he was for him to enter into life, then Christ will have no nothing else to say because he will be good. There will be nothing for him to repent of. There will be nothing else for him to do. No room for growth because he's at perfection. But yet Christ gives him something else. He says, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now watch this 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So people who feel like you have to work to either earn salvation or to stay saved, they will swear up and down that, you know, most of them that. You know, they're following God, following God perfectly. Now, if you try to talk to somebody, it's, it, you know, it's hard to convince because, you know, we're just another man. But if Christ were to or if God were to come and say, but do you do this? Have you done this before? Then they will start to see pricks being poked in their understanding to say, well, I guess I'm not as good as I thought I was. And that's exactly what happened here. Christ knew exactly what to say that will trigger this response from this young man. This young man figured he had it all together. Lo and behold, he never did. Not the way he thought he did. So, 23, then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, note, he says hardly, not ever. So let's not get this misunderstanding that every rich person has to be crooked. Every rich person came up off of ill-gotten goods and all they care about is money and they're going to hell because, you know, they covet things. That's not the case. Christ said hardly. He didn't say that they would never. He said hardly. So majority of people, according to Christ, that you know, are very wealthy. And I mean, that can even be, you know, a kind of a relative statement because, you know, to someone who lives in a, maybe a, a two bedroom apartment, 
they could be wealthy by comparison to someone who lives, you know, under a viaduct, you know, on a freeway or something like that, and so on and so forth. But, you know, nonetheless, Christ lets it be known that those who trust in their riches, trust in their things, or those that are rich, will hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, 24. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So someone that is rich, wealthy, Christ is saying it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for this person to enter to the kingdom of heaven. So notice something interesting here in 25. It says, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? So it's like at this point, it's like, well, who can be saved? Who can really do enough? Or who can, you know. Who can be saved? Christ in 26, he says, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now you will have people that say that, you know, you have to follow the commands, the commandments, and it, it is possible for a person to never sin. And, it, you know, it is possible for a person to um, you know, have to do these works. It's not just about faith, but you got to do the works in order to be saved or stay saved. But what does Christ literally say in 26? With men, this is impossible. Christ says this is impossible. But on the flip side, he says, but with God, all things are possible. So what someone might try to do is they might try to flip it. And say, well, well, yeah, you know, of course we can't do anything without God, you know, and basically they'll have the the, the understanding to say, well, if you're a, a atheist or someone who doesn't believe in Christ and you're trying to do these things and it's like, well, yeah, you can't do it. But, you know, if you have Christ, then it is possible for you to just completely stop sinning so that you don't lose your salvation. But the whole point that the whole connection that Christ is making with men, this is this is impossible. That young man, that rich young man claimed that he figured that he was good because, hey, he kept all of the commandments that Christ listed off from a youth. He said, what else do I lack? He figured to say, well, what else can I do? I'm doing everything. And lo and behold, there was something else he wasn't doing that he didn't even recognize was a problem. Right. So he goes to this whole conversation and then his disciples, he, they said they were, they were amazed. It's like, well, who can be saved then? Who can literally be good enough? Christ just got done saying there is none good but one, that being God. Who can do it? And then that's where the but comes in. But with God, all things are possible. So for someone to have their sins forgiven and to be kept that would that is all done by God by the power of God. Okay, if when if you look at the, the 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 parable of the prodigal son, we see two righteous people, one son who had no need of repentance because he never disobeyed his father, right? Then you had the second son, the prodigal son, who did disobey his father, repented, and was forgiven. So if someone is considered righteous by their works, then that means that they never can break any law ever at any time, word, thought, and deed, because we will be judged in every word, thought, and deed. Christ never committed any sins. He says, which one of you can convince me of sin? This is John 8. And in the same chapter, he says, I always do those things which please my father. Always. So Christ never sinned once in any capacity. What other man on the face of this planet can say that in any capacity at any time? Who can say that? Christ had no need of repentance. Right? In him is light. There is no darkness. So he had no need of repentance. 
So with man, man is that prodigal son. Now this, this was addressed to Israel, but still it applies to all of mankind. All of mankind. So we literally see here, Christ says with man, it is impossible. So if someone tries to give the argument of, well, you know, as a believer is possible, well, then you also have to understand that with God, you also have a choice. Just like Satan was given permission to attack Job, even the sins that you commit is by God's power to allow you to choose what you want to do. But you are kept by God, not because of what you do, but because when you accept the one whom he sent, that being Christ, you now have the righteousness of Christ. Like I said before, I always like to refer to Philippians 3, 9. Paul says he would rather have the righteousness of Christ than his own righteousness that comes by his uh, deeds of the law. That means things that he does. So I wanted to come with this video and just show that Christ says it's impossible with men. It's impossible. So if someone says that they can keep the, you know, do works in order to be saved or do enough works in order to stay saved, Show them this. With men, it is impossible. There is none good but one, that being God. That's it. You're either in Christ and perfect in him and his righteousness, or you're not. The works that you do have no bearance on your salvation because we've all fallen. There is none righteous. So I pray God got the glory first and foremost out of this. And I pray that whoever comes across this video will be blessed and edified by it. So until next time, I love you all and God bless.